Another thing which I want to say in the way of introduction is that I always aim at not speaking more than 40 minutes, but today I'm afraid I may go beyond this time limit, and so make yourself comfortable so as to be able, if it lasts too long, to have a little snooze in your chairs. Uh, the subject, as described <clears throat> for my talk, is confession as encounter with God. And I want to introduce it by reminding you of the parable of the prodigal son. I will come to it again in another context. But what is important for us in that respect, is the return of the son. This young man had left his home, rejecting his father, turning away from his family, renouncing all that was then normal and decent life. And after a moment, a time of reflection and tragedy, he comes home. And what happens, that is what I want to underline at this particular moment, is that since he left home, he was wait, expected by his father to come back. From the moment this young man left home, rejecting father, family, friends, normality of life, cleanliness of life, the father had been coming out probably not only, not only daily, but time and again in the hope that of a sudden his son will appear in the distance. And what the gospel tells us is that when this young man appeared, his father was there, waiting for him, expecting him to come, and he rushed forward to meet him. This is the relationship between God and us in confession. We are away from him, but he is not away from us. He waits for our return. He longs for our return. He cries over our misery and our betrayal of him and of ourselves. And any moment we appear in the distance, he is there, waiting for us and rushing towards us to greet us so that when we come, we do not come as mendicant. We do not come as beggars. That we do not come kneeling down before him that would stand there as a judge, condemning us by his own righteousness. He rushes towards us so that we can know that we are longed for we are loved in our misery and in our sinfulness. Not approved in our sinfulness, but loved by, in a love that never falters, never diminishes, that burns bright, that is perhaps more tragically deep than the quiet and peaceful love which the father can have for his son when there is no nothing wrong in his life. And this is, I believe, the best image of confession as encounter with God. And there is nothing else in confession that matters. The fact that we, like the prodigal son, come 
in order to meet God from whom we have parted, whom we have rejected, whom we have discarded, and are met with a father with open arms. This we must remember, because he is not meeting us as a judge, but as a savior. On the other hand, we do not sin against God directly as often as indirectly. But the way in which we sin against him indirectly is as hurtful and as tragic. Directly, you remember again the story of the prodigal son. The boy was happy in his father's house, and yet he wanted something else. He did not want the ordinaries of happiness. He wanted something exciting, something new. He did not want to wear his ordinary clothes. He wants to be dressed up like a popinjay. He wanted the excitement of a life he had never experienced and known. And what does he do? And this, I believe, is a ter terribly important moment. He turns to his father and says, look, I want another life. Living with you, living with mother, living with my brother, living in the surrounding which is mine by birth is not exciting enough. And yet, you are not that old. I cannot wait until you die to be free of you. Let us agree between us that you are dead. Give me all that would be mine when you will be dead and I turn away from you, I leave home, I abandon everything that is dear to you, and I forget you and the rest. The father does not say one word against it. The father shares out to him all that would have been his at his actual real death. And the young man goes away and lives a righteous life. Have you ever thought, I have not thought of it very often for a long time, that this is something which we do all the time with regard to God. All the time we take from him everything he has got to give. And then we turn away to use it according to our own tastes. We do not say as daringly, as impertinently, as cruelly to God, I'm not interested in you. I'm interested only in your gifts. But isn't it what we do so often? God gives us life. How do we use the life he gives us? In a way that is worthy of him and worthy of us and worthy of the gift of life? Don't we take all that gives us for granted, don't we take advantage of all the gifts of God without ever really turning to him in thoughts, only on occasion thinking, wasn't it kind of him to give me good health, friends, wealth, we are very much like the prodigal son. 
We take everything he gives, but we take possession of everything. It becomes ours, whether it is God's or not originally, is of no interest to us. It belongs to me now. I can use it as I want. In that sense, we sin against God. If we ask ourselves what sinning means, it's not simply a moral category of wrong acting. It's something which is deeper, more horrible in a way. It's a turning away, turning our back on. There is a passage in St. James's epistle in which it says something to the effect that to sin is like crossing a river. On one side of the river is God's realm. On the other side of the river is the realm of Satan. And we choose to cross this river because on that realm, on that um, side of the river, life is more interesting, more exciting. There is more to discover. And we leave God on the other side alone to cry over our betrayal, over us because we have become orphans, because we are at the mercy of evil, but we have no care for him. Sin is that. It's a moment when we turn our back on God because there are more exciting, more interesting things. We are concerned with ourselves and with these things, not with the one who loves us to the point that when we did not exist, he loved us into existence at a total risk to himself. I have quoted to some of you a passage from an ancient writer, I don't remember who it is, who gives us an image of the council between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before creation. The Father says, my son, let us create a world and man. And the son says, yes, father. And the father continues and says, yes, but man will betray his vocation. He will turn away from us and renounce us. And he will have to die. And then to save him, you will have to become men. Put on his mortality and die the death he has created and introduced into the world. You will have to die for him. And the son answers, let be so, father. And then the world and men are created. This is the cost of sin for God. He is abandoned and rejected like the father of the prodigal son. But also, he is condemned to die or death to suffer. Death and all the limitations of a life from which God is banished. This is God's love for us. This is the God to whom we say, you are not interesting enough for me to renounce all other things. I'm renouncing you, I'm turning away from you. I will turn to you indeed when I need something because you are not only the creator but the provider, the savior, the protector, but only then shall I turn to you. <coughs> Isn't it what we do? Oh, we don't speak as crudely as I'm speaking now. But is it what we do daily with regard to God?
in the prayer which we recite or not before meals, we say to God that we thank him for all his earthly gifts. Grant us also the gifts of the kingdom. Doesn't it mean that at that moment we realize that everything we have, our very being, our life, is of God, and yet that we make it into part of a created world, a world that in our mind, as it were, in our imagination, in our illusion, God has made and then left adrift. And then we ask God, make it into thy kingdom. All that is my life, all that is the world around me, make it, O Lord, into thy kingdom. Is that not what we should do all the time? Transform everything of this created and fallen world into God's realm. But it isn't what we do. We take what God makes, what God gives, and we take it away like the prodigal son. Until one day, we feel hungry. Why? Because these gifts which we received, which we stole, as it were, from God, when we snatched from God by saying to him, die now because I can't wait until you are dead to enjoy the fruits of your work, of your sacrifice, of your love. Die now. We go away and we spend it. But what happens? As long as we are rich with what God gave us, we are surrounded with people who want to take from us what we possess, exactly on the same terms as we have behaved to God. As long as we are in possession of things, they are around us, like parasites. The moment we have nothing else to give, we have spent what God uh, has given us, we are spent ourselves, then we are of no interest to people and they turn away from us. That, is that the moment we must wait to realize what we have done? Alas, very often it is the moment. It is the moment when we realize that we have condemned <coughs> God to death and that he has actually died on the cross for us. And we have accepted his sacrifice in order to be redeemed. But we are not redeemed mechanically by the death of Christ. We are redeemed if we integrate ourselves to his death and eternal life. And then a moment comes when we realize that we are deprived of everything. We have rejected and lost what God gave us. Perhaps not completely, because otherwise we couldn't even think of God and repent. But we have re rejected so much. And now, what can we do? We can remember that there was a time when we lived in the Father's house, when there was love, when there was not this desperate loneliness of rejection. And we can start on our way back. But we do not only sin against God in this direct way. We sin against God also by discarding and despising his gifts. Don't we hear from time to time people say, I wish I could die because life is too heavy. Or so many other things. 
But then also, we sin against God in another way. Through the way in which we treat people and we behave to people. God has loved everyone into existence, into life. And he has died for everyone to be able to recapture the life he had discarded and lost. Everyone is loved, and the measure of divine love is the death of Christ upon the cross. His descent into hell to join those who had been rejected forever. That is God's measure of love of our neighbor. How do we treat our neighbor? Do we treat him as someone whom God has put in our charge? Do we treat him as someone for whom we care, who matters to us, who has been put on our way for us to do for him all, all we can, or on the contrary, to treat him with cruelty, coldness, indifference. I have a notion of what I'm speaking. I belong to the early days of emigration, to a time of misery, of violence, of cruelty, of homelessness, of hunger. And I remember then when I was a boy of 10, 12, 13, I thought that the world and life was a jungle populated by wild beasts, that every person around me was a danger. Someone who wanted my destruction, that survival meant fighting and becoming as hard as nails. That is how I saw the world around me. And this is how we make the world for others. The world changed of a sudden when I discovered God, not through people, through the gospel, through the presence of God who made himself known. And then I remember how I looked at people after this discovery of God. I remember what happened, how I suddenly felt that God exists, and how the next day I came into the street, looked around at people, and thought, God loves every one of these people. I will love them, even at the cost of my life, because I want to be with God and not without him. But otherwise, for me, every human being was an enemy, was a danger, and life was a jungle. This is a way in which we sin against God by the way in which we look at people and we treat people. So, it's not surprising that Christ says, if thou bringest your gift to the altar and remembers that someone has ought against thee, leave your gifts there and go and make your peace with him or her you have offended. Because your gift is not acceptable unless you are forgiven and accepted by those or him or her whom you have reviled or wounded. There is a passage in the book of Daniel, I believe, in which Daniel <coughs> prays to God and sees his prayer ascending gradually like smoke and then being um, wiped down by a strong wind and not reaching God. And he says to him, 
What is it? Why does my prayer not mount to you, ascend to you? And God answers, because you have offended a old widow, and she cries her misery to me. I can't accept your prayer until she can forgive you and be at peace. I'm not giving proper quotations. I'm uh, giving you the, the meaning of the passage. Do we realize that? Do we realize that there can be no confession, no repentance on our part, unless we have made our peace with our neighbor or done all we could for, for that? Because we can come and ask for forgiveness, and kneel down, and beg that we may be rejected. Then we must ask ourselves, why? Did the person, was the person so deeply wounded that even my begging could not elicit forgiveness for me? Or was he so hardened or did he perceive, which happens so often, that my words did not express the cry of my soul, that it was words asking for forgiveness, but not my soul pouring out and kneeling before this person whom I have offended to be forgiven? We must ask ourselves these questions. Because when we come to confession, it is to Christ we come, not to anyone else. To that I will come back. Not to anyone else. To Christ himself, who has given his life and his debts for my salvation. But, is there anyone who says, no Lord, no Lord, he or she has rejected me. I am in hell because of this person. Can you give forgiveness without my being healed? And this is why, before we come to confession, we must ask ourselves, have I made my peace with all those whom I have offended, or at least those whose memory sticks out in my memory, those whom I have offended and of whom I am aware with shame, with pain, or perhaps with total heartless indifference. Can I come to Christ and say, forgive me, Lord, all I have done against my neighbor, against myself, because I have destroyed myself in body and soul and against you give me forgiveness so that they can start life again on what terms on the old terms having had as it were a cleansing moment and a return to evil so the first question which we must ask ourselves is in what way have I sinned against God? Like the prodigal son who said to him, what I want is what you can give, not you. You are superfluous in my life. It's only your gifts that matter. Die. But leave me your inheritance. We don't speak so crudely, but we act as crudely very often with regard to God. Or do we come to God, should prepare to come to God by asking ourselves, is there anyone whom I have offended so deeply that God cannot receive me? Because there is a cry arousing, arising from the earth saying, Lord, be merciful to me. He has broken me. He has destroyed me. Or should we think of ourselves and ask 
What have I done to my own self? How have I perverted my mind? How have I perverted my heart? What have I done with my body? Do you remember this passage in St. Paul? It says, shall I take the limbs of Christ, my body, which have become an extension of, Christ, of God's incarnation through baptism and communion and give them to a harlot. And it's not only that kind of sin, it's greed in all its forms. It's all the ways in which this body of ours, which should be holy for us in our eyes, because it is an extension of the incarnation through baptism and communion. It is this, this body we have soiled and are destroying. Do we ever think of this? We do not often relate our body to the reality of our spirit and our soul. But lately, I had to preach in Southern Cathedral on occasion for the people who had given the bodies of their dearest and nearest to the medical schools for anatomy because they felt that by doing this, their dearest and nearest were continuing to serve mankind. And a thought came back to me when I was a medical student in the first year in hospital. I had the care of a Russian who was dying a lonely death in a hospital bed without language, without family, without anyone. And he discovered that I was a Russian young man. We made friends and he died. And a year later, in the anatomy, the anatomy theater, I was confronted with his body for the study of anatomy. Do you realize what I felt? A friend whom I had to, to desiccate, whose body I had to cut up to examine because it was simply a human body that would teach me something about a body of men. It was one of the most tragic experiences of my life because I did it with what sense of veneration in a worshipful manner. He was giving me after his death a knowledge that I would use to save human lives. His body was conveying something holy to me. So we must realize the importance of our bodies, of our mind, of our soul, of our will, of everything in us, and the significance of our neighbor before we come to confession. Very often, we come to confession with the thought, I will open my mind and my heart to such and such priest. I go to such and such because I think I can trust him, either because he will be loving, merciful, or because I need someone who has vigor and will not allow me to remain in my present condition. It is not to the priests who are coming. We are coming to Christ, to Christ whom we have crucified, we ourselves, by every sin we have committed in thought or in action, with our own body and soul and with the bodies and souls of others. 
It's to Christ whom we have crucified. And there is a story in the life of um, one of the saints in which we are told of a priest who was so horrified by the sins of uh, some of his surrounding that he turned to God and said, Lord, when shall you punish them, destroy them? Because of what they are, in spite of what you have been. And Christ appears to him and says, never ask for anyone to be punished. Ask for his forgiveness and salvation. If there was only one sinner left on earth, I would be incarnate again and die again upon the cross for this one person because I cannot endure the, that one person should perish. That is the situation with Christ, of God, with regard to each of all of us. It's to him we come. But we cannot come unless we have gone first to the people for whom he has died and who, for whose sake his resurrected body is still wearing the marks of the crucifixion. And what is the role of the priest then? The priest says, no child, Christ is standing invisibly before thee, receiving thy confession. Therefore be not afraid or ashamed of me, but speak in all truth. I am but a witness. What does it mean to be a witness? What is his role then if he is not the one to whom you have come? There are three kinds of witnesses. <clears throat> there are the indifferent witnesses that are seeing an accident or something happening in the street and are asked by a policeman, have you seen what happened? Who was in the wrong? Who was in the right? And such a witness is totally truthful within the limits of his understanding but totally indifferent. He does not mind who is right or wrong as a person. None of the two is a friend or an enemy. So he can speak the truth with indifference, with justice. But there are also witnesses in a court case, witnesses for the defense who stand for the one who is accused and brings, bring all, all reasons for this person to be forgiven. And the witnesses who, for the accuser who want to prove that this person is in the wrong. What is the position of the priest? Who is he? He cannot be the one who stands indifferent because if he's a priest and not a travesty, a, a Judas to his vocation, he must be there with compassion, with a broken heart, rent asunder by compassion and by horror at the thought that this person may not find his way back to integrity and to a loving and faithful relationship with God and his neighbor. He is also there <clears throat> as we are told like the friend of the bridegroom. You remember this passage 
in the gospel that speaks of St. John the Baptist calling him the friend of the bridegroom. <coughs> the friend of the bridegroom in Jewish society was the nearest, the closest, the dearest friend of the bride and the bridegroom. He was their witness at their marriage. He brought them to the bridal chamber. He locked the door behind them and laid down across it, make it impossible for anyone to break in, to interrupt the mystery of this encounter between the bride and the bridegroom in the mystery of mutual love and mutual gift of self to one another. This is the position of the priest. He's there, not rejoicing only because the sinner has come. He has come to his savior. There is hope, there is joy, there is hope, hope. But there is also the fact that he's a sinner. There is compassion and pain and horror, a compassion that rends the soul of a priest. That is his position. He's not there to intrude into the mystery of this mutual encounter. He's there to protect it against everything else. Of course, he's not there only as a silent witness. But it can be a silent witness. I have known two men who heard confessions without saying a word, who stood there crying over the penitent and praying for his forgiveness and then giving them absolution. And I have known of a priest who, when he heard the confession of people and came back in the evening to his room performed act of penance for the sins of every one of the penitents who had been with him. Bring whole nights with the fear that the penitent does not do it to a sufficient depth. There are priests who have nothing to say because they leave it to God, but their compassion enfolds and carries the sinner and transforms him or her. There are priests who are aware of their own sinfulness to such an extent that they cannot give you advice beyond a certain point. I can give you one example. Can you endure 10 more minutes? I, I remember going to confession to a priest who was not an honored man. He drank desperately. He was despised. He came to church drunken. He could not celebrate. I put him in a corner of the church and stood in front of him in case he falls, for him to fall on my back and not in front of the whole small congregation. I did not know why he had come to this point. I discovered later why. That he was a young officer in the White Army at the moment when the White Army left Crimea. He was on one ship and his wife and children were on another one. The ship was bombed and sunk and he saw his wife and children die, drowned in the sea. I told the story to someone who needed it, and with horror, what I heard was, why did he start drinking? Job did not drink, he repented, or he prayed to God, God forgive that kind of reaction. But this man, I went to confession to him at a moment when our parish priest had been put into prison by the occupying powers of France. 
I made my confession, and he stood over me crying, not drunken tears, but tears of real confession, of compassion. And when I had finished my confession, he said to me, you know who and what I am. I'm unworthy of hear your, hearing your confession. And I should not say a word of advice, but I will tell you one thing. You are still young. Struggle not to become what I have become, not to fall as low as I have fallen. Here is a passage from the gospel, which is an answer to your confession. Take it with me and forgive me for not being able to give me a better advice. This is the greatest advice I ever heard, not because of the passage of the gospel, but because of the way in which this man spoke. I know that the priest is a human being and listens, and he can at times be helpful. I remember one or two occasions when a priest heard the confession and felt that the confession was not full, that there was something which should have been said and was not being said, and addressing himself to the penitent said, all oh, you have said is secondary. There is one thing you have not said which is a thing that matters. What is it? And then the painter burst into tears and said the only thing that was worth saying. I know occasions when a priest can give advice because in this struggle of his soul, of a human being, in his mind and body and self for writing one's life, one may need advice, do this or do that. And this should be done. But it should be done by a priest who is broken hearted compassion and who says to the person in all humility, broken heartedly, not from the height of his wisdom, but from the depths of his own repentance, because a priest who listens to a confession makes simultaneously his own confession. He cries over his own unworthiness and sinfulness. He can give advice, yes. But, and we must be able to receive it, knowing that it may be, it is possibly, probably, certainly imperfect, but it is sincere and true it is a moment when this priest opens his own heart and soul, except to be seen in his frailty, because when he gives advice, he speaks from within his frailty and not within, from the height of his worthiness. And there are times when a priest can say nothing. He can say, God has given me nothing for you. There are two occasions when St. Ambrose of Optida said that to penitents. Twice came, penitents came to him, made their confession, asked for advice, and for two, three days he kept them waiting for a reply. And on the two occasions, a man came and said, Father, we must go back to our villages, and you are not giving me a reply. And twice he said, for three days have I prayed to the Mother of God for advice. She is silent. What can I say? Go and pray to her for help. This is something which is legitimate which doesn't correspond, mean that the priest is indifferent or is incapable of giving advice. It's a moment when he is so deeply aware that what he has got to do or say is what God gives him to do and say, 
that he cannot act from within his own alleged wisdom. And then I come to the last point, rejoice. Um, there are occasions when the priest has nothing to say and can do nothing. And there are occasions when a penitent was, must do something before he receives forgiveness. I'll give you an example of the last thing. I remember someone who came to confession to me, oh, years ago, and uh, the substance of the confession was that he was in the habit of borrowing money and never giving it back. And having made his confession, expressed his sorrow and his shame, he was just about to kneel down to receive absolution. And I said, no, nothing doing to receive absolution. You go back and you pay your debts, and then you come and receive absolution. This is a very crude example, but this is something that should happen from time to time. From time to time, perhaps not every time, we must be very thoughtful and caring for the people who come to confession to us, not send them away uh, unforgiven, unshriven, or condemned by our words and behavior. But there are moments when we must be able to say, no, you are not going to receive God's forgiveness without doing anything about what you have done to people. Put things right. There are things which cannot be put right immediately. The example I gave you is a simple example. But put, begin to put things right. Go and see the people you have offended. Ask Explain to them that you are in the wrong. Make them feel and understand that you know that you are in the wrong. That they have a right and a power to forgive you, to open for you the door of forgiveness by God. And then come and receive forgiveness at the, alt at the altar. And there are other occasions, there are other cases, which may be rare, when the priest knows he can do nothing and God alone can do something. And that's where uh, I see a link between confession and communion. I will tell you one story which I will never, never forget in my life. More than 50 years ago when I came to this country, a young woman came to me and said, I want to talk to you. I belong to a, living, love, to a believing family. I'm sent to receive communion on Easter every year. And I believe neither in God, nor in the church, nor in communion, nor in any such thing. And I can no longer face the betrayal of my own self when I come to communion and receive communion believe in nothing that it represents. What shall I do? And I said, don't worry. Even if you came to communion, I would not give you communion. So you are safe. But let us meet and talk about it. I will try to share with you what I was taught, what I incipiently understand. And she came to me every week in Lent on Fridays, and I proved incapable of helping her at all. And on Good Friday when she came, I said to her in shame, with a deep pain in my heart, I have been able to do nothing for you. If God doesn't help you, I don't know. Let us go to the chapel, kneel before the Polshenitsa, the um, icon of Christ in the tomb, and pray for advice. And this we did. I knelt down, she stood for a while, and then knelt down also because she felt awkward standing uh, above me. And I prayed to God and said, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to give to this girl. She needs, she needs salvation. And yet I cannot give her anything over the door for her. Do something. And then I kept quiet and silent and desperate 
And a thought came to me. And I turned to her and said, does it matter to you whether you find God or not, or is it indifferent? And she said to me, it matters. Before if God doesn't exist, life has no meaning, and I do, do not want to live. What shall I do? And I said, I don't know. And I went on, asking God, asking God. And then another thought came to me, more frightening than the first one. I turned to her and said, if you promise to do whatever I will tell you, in God's name I promise you that you'll find your way to him. And she said, I do promise. What shall I do? And I said, I don't know. And I went on begging, begging. And then a third thought came that frightened me more than I can say. I turned to her and said, tomorrow morning, Saturday in Holy Week, I will be celebrating the liturgy. You come to communion. And before you receive communion, stand before the holy cup and say, Lord, <clears throat> your church have betrayed me. Your priests have betrayed me. My family has betrayed me. And you also. I come not to you. I will receive communion. If you act, I announce you once and forever. He said, I can't do that. Said, yes, you can do that because I will answer for your blasphemy before God. And she came. She stood before the Holy Cup and she said these frightening words. And then she received communion, and I received a note from her a few days later. I do not know whether God exists or not, but what I know for sure is that what I received was neither bread nor wine, but something else I can't identify. That was the beginning of our conversion, of a deep, incredible change in her life. So there are moments when the priest can do nothing except stand in awe, in compassion, broadheartedly, in terror before God and before the person who has come to, con to confession and pray and pray and then act in the way in which he can. Ultimately, as I said in the beginning, as I uh, say now in the example I gave you of this young woman, confession is an encounter with Christ himself. The priest may be superfluous. The priest may be, as it were, absent. What he can do is to receive the penitence, confession, identify with it brokenheartedly, in compassion, in, f in suffering together, pray desperately, and then leave it to God to act freely. But the role of the penitent is then if he has received forgiveness, to bear fruit of it, to choose those things he can do to repair the evil or the harm he has done. I remember how surprised I was when I went to Father Afanasi for the first time for confession. And when I had finished, he said, and now think a few moments. You have confessed a certain number of things, which Things are um, such that you can tackle them. Undertake it and tackle these ones. Those which are too big for you, leave for the moment, because when you will have conquered the smaller ones, you'll be able 
to conquer the bigger ones. And the last thing, at times, it doesn't not apply to the majority of you, but at times old people say to me, it's terrible. The older I become, the frailer I become, the less I'm in command of myself, the more horribly the sins of the past emerge and prevent me from sleeping. All the night I think of the evil I have done in my life or the wrongs I have committed. What can I do? I went to the doctor. He gave me pills for me to sleep. But then, instead of sleeping and of agonizing over my sins, it becomes nightmares. I don't know what to do. I said to her, you know what happens? We do not live our lives only once, not in terms of reincarnation, of course, but we act a certain way when we are 20 and 30 and 50 and 60 at the measure of our spiritual maturity, of our understanding. And then years pass and we change. And the moment comes when God brings out from the past the evil we have committed when we were too young to understand it and confront us with it within our present experience and say to us, if you were back in that situation, what you, would you do the same? And if you can say never, make a sign of the cross and say, I am now free and forgiven, and it will go. But if you can say, mm, yes, possibly I would, then you will have your nightmare again. There are more cynical people. I remember a lady who came five or six times with the same confession. And I said, look, you have made this confession five or six times. You have Pride is something which we know, on the whole, rather little about. Pride, in its full sense, is the attitude of Satan, who says, I am the judge of all things. I don't care for God's judgment. More often, what we know is um, vanity, the sense that we are worthy of admiration or of respect. Uh, that is our measure of pride. But the pride which um, the fathers, sorry, the word which the fathers use for pride applies to the words of, Saint, of Lucifer. I will set my throne as high as God's. I don't need God's judgment. I am my own judge. I need uh, no one's judgment. I am my own judge. And of course, as my own judge, I'm always right. Well, in the case of vanity, um, one second. St. John of the Ladder says, a, va a vain person is a coward before the judgment of men and arrogant before the judgment of God. He's afraid of the people who surround him because they are there and accusing him or judging him. God is somewhere in the sky away. And I think we must remember that vanity is a form of cowardice. Also, at times, vanity um, is misplaced or can be conquered in another way. I'll give you an example. A number of years ago, a young woman came to me, sat with her hand, head bent and a horrible expression on her face 
And I said, what's the matter with you? I'm a sinner. I said, oh, well, we all know that. But why this uh, condition? I'm a sinner. And in what particular way? Whenever I see my face in a mirror, I find that I'm lovely. I said, you know, it's true. <laughs> and she looked at me in horror and said, so there is no hope for me? I said, yes, there is hope for you. You know what you do? Between pride you know, or vanity on the one hand and humility of which you know nothing and I know nothing so I can't teach it to you, there is halfway house. This halfway was, house is called gratitude. So whenever you see your, uh, your face, be grateful for it. And here is a rule for you. Three times a day, place yourself before a mirror and look at every feature uh, in your face. If you find that your forehead, your uh, brow, your eyes, your nose, your lips, your cheeks, your ears are well shaped and lovely, look at them and say, how lovely. Oh God, thank you for making a present of such lovely things because I have done nothing to have them. And when you will have finished all that, you add, Lord, forgive me for putting on this lovely face this horrible expression. <laughs> and I think I had told her the truth. Because to jump from pride, of which I believe no one knows anything, really, or vanity, which we all know very well and too well, to humility, of which we do not know anything, there is this halfway uh, place, gratitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are people who know that they, they possess nothing. They are nothing except that they possess such the wealth of blessings given by God. And they are such creatures which God has loved to the point of giving his life for them and waiting for them to come into eternity. Well, there is room for gratitude connected with the sense that I possess nothing, and yet I have got everything by God's mercy, grace, and love. Could you say something about people who have been so abused and wounded that they don't have within them the capacity to perceive where they've gone wrong. People who have been so abused in the childhood that they cannot see anymore what is wrong cannot uh, repent for what they don't see. But they can long for what they still can perceive as being beauty and truth and right and leave it to God to heal them but also to remember I think one should remember that however abused one is and perceived one's own person is soiled one must be prepared to accept the fact that soiled or not, we are beloved by God. That he does not love us for our purity, for our integrity. He loves us because we are we. He loves us in, not even in spite of all. He simply loves us. And therefore, instead of concentrating on our humiliation, our abasement, we must turn to God and say, you can love me as I am, 
if I'm loved by you, the measure of my personality is your love, not what has happened to my body or to my soul. It is not something one can do easily oneself. I think it's something for which we can be helped. But we must remember that if we are loved by God in such a way, and if we are loved by certain people who know us in the same way in which God loves us, we can turn ourselves and say, I can love myself. Not with pride, with humility, with amazement, but love. <laughs> Question which <clears throat> is mighty difficult to answer because <clears throat> this passage of the Old Testament expresses the attitude of an Old Testamental body before the revelation of love divine as it is revealed in Christ. It does not mean that we are not on that level from time to time, that when we see unrighteousness and evil, we do not cry inwardly, let it be destroyed. But it is because we haven't got in ourselves the depth and love and um, oneness with Christ that would allow us to take the burden on us. I remember a shameful event in which I, wa <clears throat> I was uh, an actor. I had invited to speak to a group of Russian pupils um, a, uh, a clergyman of another denomination and he gave a talk in which he reviled our faith from end to end and I, I burnt with rage and indignation but being the host I could do nothing much about it but going home I remember running down the steps in the metro and reciting the words of one of the Psalms the may um, his road be darkness and an angel of God um, offending him. May his road be slippery and an angel of God beating him up. And then I realized that it was not quite Christian. But I, <laughs> but I found myself exactly in the mood of one of the Psalms. But this is outgrown in uh, the New Testament. Um, wait a minute. Um, I think we must learn to carry one another's burdens to the last. And um, these words, as so many others, we repeat because they are in the Psalms, but they are outgrown, as it were. I remember speaking to someone about um, Judas and saying how terrible it is that he is condemned for all eternity for what he had done on earth. Peter had met Christ again, asked forgiveness and be forgiven. And the wise man to whom I had turned said to me, yes, but when Christ descended into hell, he met Judas, and perhaps Judas was saved also.